California was one of the last places to be colonized in the Americas, a faraway, sparsely populated province that didn't interest the powerful all that much. It eventually became synonymous with the American dream, a place to strike it rich, whether in a mining camp, Hollywood, or tech. To find out how this happened, join me for this brief look at the history and politics of California. Human beings have lived in California, especially southern part, since at least 19,000 years ago, although recent controversial findings have pushed the date back further to at least 130,000 years ago, but they remain unconfirmed. Indigenous settlements in the region were quite distinct from most of the rest of North America. That's because California's deserts and rugged topography not only made it difficult to travel long distances and thus isolate them both from the rest of the continent and each other, but also meant that war was made impractical and thus no large conquering tribes ever developed. This meant that most early inhabitants of what is now California lived in small groups of 50 to 500 individual members. Another huge difference was that a lack of rain in the area during the growing season meant agriculture was not practical and thus people processed wild nuts and berries and fished to survive. The acorn, leached of toxic acids and turned into meal, was a staple of the diet of most California native peoples. An ample food supply, temperate climate, and an absence of wars contributed to a large healthy population, the largest density outside of Mexico, and a diverse one too. It is estimated that there may have been as many as 135 distinct languages, including that of the Karok, Maidu, Kawileño, Chumash, Mojave, Yokuts, Pomo, Paiute, and Modoc, each uniquely adapted to local ecosystems. This all began to change with the arrival of the Europeans. The Spanish had conquered Mexico in the 1520s and soon began spreading north in search of gold. In the 1530s, their explorations took them to the Baja Peninsula, which they mistook for an island and thus gave the place the name of California, a mythical isle described in a novel popular at the time. By 1542, when the first European expedition explored what is now the California coast, the Spanish knew California was not an island, but the name had stuck, and thus, much later, when they began settling the area, the peninsula became Baja, or Lower California, and the northern part became Alta, or Upper California. The man in charge of the voyage in 1542 was Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, one of Cortes's former soldiers. His ship sailed into San Diego Bay in September of that year and sailed as far north as San Miguel Island, but found little of interest to the Spanish. There was no gold and the indigenous people lived at a basic subsistence level, so there was no follow-up and even the names that Cabrillo gave the landscape didn't stick. In 1565, the Spanish discovered the winds that linked Asia to the Americas and established a trade route from the Philippines to Mexico that turned south around Santa Catalina Island. This meant that Spanish ships frequented the California coast, something that eventually brought other European powers to the area, including the British and Russians. The most famous of these was in June 1579, when Sir Francis Drake, looking for a Northwest Passage, decided to anchor somewhere north of San Francisco and stay there for about a month. There he encountered the Coast Miwok, the first European contact with indigenous Californians. The group was friendly to the English, gifts were exchanged, and the natives made a point of quote-unquote crowning Sir Francis Drake, presumably as a sign of respect. Drake claimed the land for England, calling it New Albion, and then left, never to come back. Although a new expedition came to California in 1602 under the command of Sebastián Vizcaíno, looking for safe harbors for the Spanish galleons coming from the Philippines, and despite finding in Monterey Bay a place that Vizcaíno thought would be suitable for crops, the Spanish still did not make any efforts to make permanent settlements in California. Instead, it would take geopolitical considerations after the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763 and the leadership of José de Galvez, a visitador in New Spain, for the Spanish to finally try to settle California. This attempt was made through a combination of military forts, presidios, and mission churches, overseen by Franciscan fathers led by Junipero Serra. In 1769, the first party set north from Baja California and the line of Spanish settlement along the coast was inaugurated when soldiers and priests established a presidio and mission church at San Diego. This expedition, led by Portola, would be followed with one by Fages in 1770 and Juan Bautista de Anza in 1774 and 1776, stretching the limits of the California frontier. By the end of this period, Alta California had three more presidios at Monterey in 1770, San Francisco in 1776, and Santa Barbara in 1780 and no fewer than 21 missions, all about one day horseback's ride apart, connected to each other by a Camino Real. In addition to the missions and presidios, small towns or pueblos sprang up, 
The earliest of these were associated with the missions and presidios, but in 1777, an independent civil pueblo was created on San Jose and others followed. The pueblos tried to attract settlers with land grants and other inducements and were governed by an alcalde, a combination of judge and mayor, assisted by a council called the ayuntamiento. In theory, the missions were in the business of converting souls. In exchange for their labor, the natives were to be instructed in Spanish, the Catholic faith, agriculture, or some other useful skill while they lived in the missions or in their vicinity. What many of them got instead, more often than not, was death, as the arrival of the Europeans spread disease that the natives had little immunity to. Within a century of European arrival, an estimated 90% of indigenous people had perished. Not surprisingly then, native resistance was not uncommon. At the end of the 19th century, Spain began to get more serious about the administration of its far-flung provinces and in 1804 divided what had been previously known as Las Californias into the distinct upper and lower provinces. The attention was short-lived, however. In 1808, Napoleon's invasion of Spain and the imposition of his brother as king appended the Spanish colonial system. This led to massive revolts all over Spanish America, but California remained uninvolved and unaffected. The exception was a November 1818 attack by an Argentine privateer and Napoleonic army veteran, Hippolito Bouchard, who burnt down Monterey but did not permanently occupy it. Three years later, Mexico declared itself independent and California became a territory within a new country. This led to a number of changes. First was the liberalization of trade which allowed people to trade with foreigners. Second, partly because of this, there was an influx of foreigners, particularly Americans, who were allowed to migrate to California if they converted to Catholicism. But most importantly, there was a dismantling of the mission system, what the government called secularization. In theory, the mission lands were held in trust for the natives living there when the Franciscans arrived, so lands should have been given back to them. But of course, that didn't happen. Instead, a few California families ended up with most of the land in the form of massive ranchos, creating a new elite in the territory and paving the way for an economy based almost entirely in the production of cattle and hides in exchange for manufactured goods from elsewhere. It was a feudal society with turbulent politics. Between 1831 and 1836, California had 11 different gubernatorial administrations, not counting three hapless individuals who were appointed to the governorship but whom the Californians did not permit to take office. There were rivalries between Northerners and Southerners, but also resentment against faraway Mexico City, especially after the passage of the Siete Leyes in 1836, a political reorganization that centralized power in the national government. Discontent with the Siete Leyes brought about a revolt led by Juan Bautista Alvarado that seized the capital, raised a lone Red Star flag, and declared California a free and sovereign state. This was short-lived, however. Only a few months later, the Mexican government convinced Alvarado to bring back California to the fold with him as governor. Headaches for Mexico City had only just begun, though. In 1842, the U.S. Pacific Squadron, under the leadership of Commodore Thomas Ab Catsby Jones, easily overran Monterey and declared California to be under the protection of the U.S. By mistake. Turns out that Commodore Jones based his actions on the rumor that Mexico and the United States were at war. One day later, he realized that wasn't the case, so he simply sailed away. The real invasion came five years later. The two countries had been at odds over Texas ever since 1836 when the province broke away, largely because of American newcomers. In 1845, war finally broke out after the U.S. annexed Texas and inherited the state's disputed territory claims. When news reached California, a number of American settlers and a U.S. battalion took over Sonoma and declared the state a free republic. Known as the Bear Flag Revolt, one of its leaders was John C. Fremont, a future senator of California and first Republican presidential nominee. Although the Republic lasted less than a month because they quickly joined an invading American naval force that declared the region part of the United States, their story lives on in the current state flag. Californians responded to the American invasion and managed to win some important battles, including the retaking of Los Angeles and Dominguez Rancho in 1846. But their fortunes turned after the Battle of San Pascual and soon lost control of the province. Meanwhile, fueled by manifest destiny in a superior army, by September 1847, the U.S. had captured Mexico City. This forced the Mexicans to sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in February 1848, which ceded not just California, but most of the present-day American Southwest to the United States. 
a sparsely populated province that was even further away from the American capital than the Mexican one, faced an uncertain future in 1848. But however things might have turned out, California's history was about to completely change even before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was finalized. That's because on January 24, 1848, gold was discovered in Coloma, in Northern California. A gold rush ensued. In the immediate aftermath, there were around 100,000 people that came from all over the globe. At first, this was from places that were closer by boat, like Mexico, China, Chile, and even Australia. And later, after news finally made it around Tierra del Fuego and to the North Atlantic, from the East Coast. Boom towns like Sacramento and Stockton sprung up, and earlier ones like San Francisco became about 25 times larger. The sudden population explosion and the lack of an established government made it a wild and lawless frontier, so much so that miners had to create their own rules. This meant that the first wave of prospectors, known as 48ers, got the best mining claims but lost them for the most part to the 49ers, Americans who came later, as they were able to use force or the constituted authority to discriminate against the former, especially if they were Mexican, Native, or Chinese. Subsequent laws, like the Foreigner's Miner's Tax, finished the job. Similarly, many of the old rancho elite lost their land to squatters and even in later years, when the United States created a process where owners could prove their claims in court, the procedure took so long that most of the Spanish rancheros ended up bankrupt. Natives had it even worse, as beyond taking their land, there was a systematic campaign to annihilate them between 1846 and 1873. Enslavement, kidnapping, and rape of indigenous people during this period were also common. The population explosion also fast-tracked statehood for California, which was admitted as a free state in September 1850. This did not mean, however, that there was no sympathy for slavery in the state. When the Civil War began, secessionists in San Francisco tried to have California and Oregon secede, but failed. Californios and Democrats in Southern California also voted to have a separate territorial government in the South, but their attempts at secession were blocked by federal troops. For the rest of the conflict, California contributed with gold and about 17,000 men for the war effort. The end of the war would bring another development that would dramatically change California's history, the railroad. The first was an intercontinental railroad that connected San Francisco to Iowa and was finished in 1869. The second, built over Gadsden Purchase land from 1854, linked Los Angeles to Texas in 1881. The connecting track meant not only that California's isolation was now a thing of the past, and therefore people and goods could have moved freely about, making the state an economic powerhouse, but also that opportunities that were previously unprofitable would no longer be so. In the specific case of Southern California, it also meant the transformation of Los Angeles into a major metropolis, which up to that point had remained comparatively uninhabited since it was not the epicenter of the gold rush. Not to say that there were only positive consequences. Chinese labor had been used extensively in the construction of the railroad, and when that finished, many of them decided to settle in California, especially in and around San Francisco. A national economic downturn, caused by the Panic of 1873, however, provoked serious unemployment, and soon Chinese immigrants were blamed for lack of jobs and low wages. Dennis Kearney, in particular, an Irish leader of the Working Men's Party of California, became famous for agitating against Chinese people and was largely successful in passing a number of restrictions that prevented naturalization and made it harder for Chinese to settle in the state. This culminated at the national level with the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which banned Chinese immigration for 10 years and which in turn led to a famous Supreme Court case in 1898, the United States v. Wong Kim Mark. The reason was that despite having been born in San Francisco, when Wong tried to re-enter the U.S. after visiting his parents in China, immigration authorities refused to admit him, claiming he was not a citizen. The Supreme Court disagreed and granted him citizenship based on the 14th Amendment, making Ju Soli the standard for all American children. Two other important political developments in California history occurred around this period. First was the conservation movement, best exemplified by the activism of John Muir, which led to the establishment of the Yosemite National Park in 1890 and the foundation of the Sierra Club in 1892. The other was a backlash against corporate interests, which eventually led to the creation of the progressive movement in the 1890s. In California, this began with the Constitution of 1879, which was created to counter the monopoly power railroads had obtained, continued by granting women the right to vote, 
and culminated with the 1911 legislative session which reformed both state government and created multiple forms of direct democracy, including the option of referendum and the recall of politicians. Another Californian staple also began at the turn of the century, Hollywood. Film technology had been developed in the East and thus many studios had sprung up in the broader New York area. But in the 1910s, this began to shift out West for three reasons. First, films in California could avoid paying fees to Thomas Edison, who owned many of the necessary patents. Second, the climate meant that light was better and one could film for a longer period of time. And finally, California offered a wide variety of natural settings, desert, mountains, and beach, all a short drive away. It also helped that the European film industry, which had been dominant up to that point, was obliterated by World War I. Once established, the film industry would attract other parts of the entertainment business to set up there. TV shows like I Love Lucy and Superman in the 1950s, and eventually Disney and Pixar. California continued to prosper and grow. Even San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake, the worst natural disaster in California history. During the Great Depression, it was comparatively well enough that it attracted migrants from the rest of the country. Most famously, the Okies, poor migrants from Oklahoma, forced to leave their homesteads by the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. It was also able to build a symbol of the state, the Golden Gate Bridge, during this period, in 1937. Although World War II had a shameful episode for the Japanese, individuals who had replaced Chinese labor in the 1880s were relocated and incarcerated because of unwarranted fears over their loyalty. Overall, the war accelerated the growth and prosperity trend. Population more than doubled between 1940 and 1960. People came for all kinds of reasons. Some came because of the Bracero program, a guest worker scheme that brought thousands of Mexican laborers to pick crops and work in the state's fields. Black people came looking to escape the segregation and racism of the Deep South and ended up in places like Oakland and Los Angeles. Others came for college. The California Master Plan for Higher Education, developed in 1960, supercharged access to higher degrees and set the seeds for its tech future. Yet others, like the hippies, came because the state became the epicenter of the counterculture of the 1960s, especially San Francisco's Hyde Asbury neighborhood, a place that had once enjoyed cheap rents and access to some of the best writers of the beat generation of the 1950s. Backlash to the counterculture, in turn, made the Republican politics of law and order and low taxes a successful combination for the next few decades. Ronald Reagan, a charismatic Hollywood B-lister and future president that served as governor between 1967 and 1975, was the epitome of this trend. Most significantly for the future, however, was the passage of Proposition 13 in 1978, which made it unconstitutional to raise property taxes above 1% of a house's assessed value. This has had all kinds of effects, the most important of which is discouraging the changing of houses, either by selling or renting because it would probably result in a tax raise. Still, progressive politics did not disappear during this period, of course. Cesar Chavez, a Chicano man who looked to improve the working conditions of farm workers in the San Joaquin Valley, continued the proud California tradition of labor organizing. In fact, what caused California to go from a red state to purple and then solid blue was not necessarily disagreement with the tax or law and order message, but rather demographic change in a specific event in 1994. Proposition 187. Governor Pete Wilson tried to mobilize the electorate with his anti-illegal immigration stances. He strongly supported the 187 proposal, which was intended to ban the children of anyone without proper immigration status from going to school or receiving any benefit from the state. This was promptly stopped as unconstitutional but it really proved unpopular with sectors of the electorate that didn't usually vote, but suddenly began to do at a much higher rate, Hispanics. This ensured the defeat of every Republican candidate for governor since then, except for Arnold Schwarzenegger, a guy that was fortunate to get in in the first place since he won a recall election of a rather unpopular governor, Gray Davis. Currently, Democrats also hold supermajorities in the state legislature, one of only eight states in the country. In the meantime, Silicon Valley was coming onto its own. Technology firms had had a long history in the Bay Area because of the presence of the U.S. Navy and the existence of research universities like Stanford and the California Institute of Technology. But what began modern Silicon Valley was the arrival of William Shockley, the co-inventor of the first working transistor. That, coupled with the leadership of Frederick Terman, a Stanford provost, 
that encouraged students to start their own companies and the wide availability of venture capital began a process that eventually culminated with the founding of Intel in 1968, Apple in 1976, and Google in 1995, just to name a few. Today, the state faces serious problems, not least of which is the lack of affordable housing, but also major issues regarding water access, wildfires, and other environmental problems. Even as it continues to be the largest state economy in the country, have the most companies in the Fortune 500, and the most valuable tech companies in the world in Silicon Valley, inequality has become a huge problem, and the dynamism that brought hope and a piece of the American dream seems to have faded away as social mobility has seriously deteriorated. Can California recapture the magic that made it a magnet for people the world over? Right now, it's unclear.